You are listening to MSP 1337. I'm your host, Chris Johnson, and I'd like to thank you for joining us today. Uh, first and foremost, I'd like to thank our sponsor, MSP Ignite. MSP Ignite offers a peer group experience that is unique to managed service providers in the technology industry. If you are serious about implementing a model for success through sharing and collaboration of best practices, this is the best way to do it. Head on over to msp-ignite.com to get more information. All right, on to the show. Welcome everybody to this episode of MSP 1337. It seems like only yesterday we were still enjoying the lazy days of summer and yet here we are fast approaching winter. So last month was Cybersecurity Awareness Month and it seems like in two seconds, we were out of October. And it inspired me for this episode as we roll into season two, what are the things that MSPs, whether you're big or small, can be doing to go beyond Cybersecurity Awareness Month and start really executing a cybersecurity program in your organization? So over the next few weeks, we're going to be tackling small bits that can be accomplished in one week at a time to really improve your cybersecurity posture and, and grow your cybersecurity offering. Uh, today, I've got Charles Love of Showtech Solutions. Welcome, Charles. Hey, thanks a lot. So in that monologue that I just gave of, you know, lazy summer days and now we're in winter, we've been trying to establish, and you've been on plenty of episodes where we've talked about you know, implement third-party vendor assessments, or how do you determine that you're onboarding and that the client's a good fit for you? What are the risks that you're dealing with? And so this week, specifically first episode of November, second episode of season two, I have three things that I want to talk about. One is getting started. This should be an easy one, even though I know it's not. Number two is the security awareness training do's and don'ts, because I think that's a critical one. And then the third one that I have is, come on, Chris, can you really tell me that I can get something done in one week? Yes, we can. So Charles, we were talking a little bit before we got on the show, and I was explaining that I've listened to some great podcasts in, in recent days. Uh, actually, last week as I was you know, traveling to Chicago and, and getting ready to meet with some MSP Ignite members, and I listened to the IOTSA Secure Connection podcast with Ryan Morris, and he interviewed Vince Chrysler, and it was all about getting started. Surprise! So a couple of the things that he said that I, I really want to just throw out there, and this is the quote that I'm taking directly from Vince Chrysler, how to filter out the noise. Charles, Step me through it. You're in the trenches. You're an MSP that's really making a difference, I believe. Walk me through what, what what's noise to you and how do you kind of filter through that right now as you look at putting new layers and cybersecurity services together in your organization? Well, first off, we need to figure out where we are, right? So, you know, you've had that customer for 10 years. You You think you know everything there is to know until you start to look. You're like, wait a minute, why is this person a SharePoint admin? Why is this person a global admin? Like all these things that you, you just simply didn't know, right? Um, because somebody at some point in time, maybe a year ago did a thing and forgot to undo the thing. Right, they look, now this is time you're saying to essentially look in the mirror. Correct, so, so first thing you gotta do is you gotta baseline. Yep. And I don't care if it's on a napkin, Excel file, you know, we use a couple of, uh, you know, VCIO tools where we can load things up, but you mm -hmm. have to kind of like stop, pretend you don't know this customer, right? And just start over. If you were going to take these people on brand new, how would you rate them, right? Are they, do they have a BCDR plan? Do they, I don't know, who's the global admin? Who has the keys of the kingdom? Things like that. And make sure that for your customer, you know what it is so that you can kind of, in, you know, enhance upon that. And so Does that Charles, make sense? yeah, I was just going to throw in there, like, you know, we, we talk about what are the tools we use to do our jobs, right. To do our jobs well. And I think back, you know, five, six, seven years ago, you know, being in the managed service space, the tools weren't necessarily 
uh, there to help you get those answers really fast, right? Like you would onboard a client over a series of weeks, or maybe you called it the 30 day onboarding or the 90 day, Mm -hmm. like it wasn't something that we just said, Oh, today's Tuesday. I'm onboarding Acme company and we'll be done on Wednesday. Right? Like we now have tools though, whether it's like, uh, you know, like a rapid fire tools where you can do like a little quick AD audit or, or some of the tools like that, where you get answers that, man, th- these are like dream tools in some respects. And yet they also put us in a position of going, what risks am I taking on with this client? As I consider how quickly do I need to get security layers added to get that risk down fast? Yeah. Yeah. But it, but it all starts with that baseline, whatever it is. Right. I don't, I don't care what you, what tool you use or not use. What do you consider your MSP best practice? Right. So right. If, if, if you were going to give out gold stars, right. In all these various categories, who gets five stars, who gets no stars. And when right. you're using the star model that you, you've just come up with, which is, I mean, I think whether it's stars or, or smiley faces or friendly yeah. faces, this is going to be different, I think, for not every MSP, but I think a lot of MSPs are going to grade differently based on their security maturity. So would you say that there's like three to five things, though, that are kind of like, I don't want to say deal breakers, but it kind of comes back to, because um, the reality is we're, we're all in this together, right? I, if I heard Ryan Morris say that this we're in, we're in a supply chain that it one mistake by one organization impacts all of the other organizations in the supply chain. So in this particular case, you know, if the client doesn't meet the best practices or is really scoring poorly, we're not advocating like you should not bring them on as a client because obviously they're desperate and in need of a lot of help. Yeah. Yeah. But it's, 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 it's most, it goes back to being found foundationally secure, right? I'll I'll just give you an example. Take a look at a customer. We'll just talk 365 for a minute because that's easy. Okay. Um, Who are privileged admins, Right. Who has maybe not the keys to the kingdom, but who has one of the keys to the kingdom, right? And are they following what you recommend, which is two-factor turned on, a secondary admin account, things like that? Right. Do you um, even know who your partner is on record? Exactly. Mm-hmm. Like, uh, <clears throat> you know, and, and that's another one, right? Like, how many partners are there and are they active? Sure. Because in Microsoft land, even if when you get rid of a partner, the name never goes away, but you can see the rights have been removed. Right. Um, but man, something as simple as who is a global admin and are they enforced two factor? That's huge, right? People go in back in the day uh, and just you know unforced two factor, even though you're supposed to have it on, they turn it off. And man, that is a scary time when you realize that they fell for that phishing attempt, and now that global admin has been compromised. So this this makes me think about. Uh, you know, MSPs, we like, we, we picked this line of work cause we like it. Right. Like we didn't, you know, I could, I could have gone a lot of different directions. Right. Like we, we, we aren't told like, Chris, you should go to school to be in it. No, I, I gravitated towards it. Right. Like I started putting PCs together. I'm like, man, this is fun. Uh, you know, every day I get up and I get to enjoy what I do but I like solving big problems, right? Like I like to go, well, what's the biggest problem that you actually have that we need to solve, right? Like that's, that's the conversation we like having. And what you just described is like, hey, this one little toggle switch can make a huge impact yeah. and it has really no bearing on you, Mr. Customer, on your day-to-day ability to send an email. Yeah, so, so go back to that baseline. It is not a one-time baseline, right? It's kind of like, you know, there's videos on, the dare I say it, on TikTok, right? Where the, dare the, the, you say. Yeah. The parent cleans the whole room. They're holding the broom. They look at the room. It's clean. They smile. They look. They hear a noise. They come back, and it's all a mess again. Right. Right. Exactly how it left off. I bet that family has Legos. Yeah. and But that's how it works, right? Right. So I'm setting up a tenant. I, I secure it. I do all my, my things that I do when I secure a tenant. And I look, I come back. Now there's 17 global admins, 
Well, right. so, so you're, you're talking about something that's really important here where we get into what is a security model that is continuous and how to enforce that, which is your compliance. And I think that's a perfect example of where compliance comes into play because compliance is never static, right? You can't, For sure. you can have a firewall in place and, and it's operating correctly and it's doing its job, but it, but it doesn't mean that it's, it's perfect, but from a security standpoint, it's better than if I look at it through the lens of compliance, right? Checkbox, firewalls in play. doesn't work that yeah. way. Yeah. It's just, it's, it's really important to, to go back and it's just because you, you, you set something up a certain way. doesn't mean it's going to stay that way. Right. So your stack needs to complement that. Right. So for example, I use tools that alert me when there's a security change. Right. And then right. I can go back and be like, huh, why, why did Chris give somebody that kind of access? And so now I have a recording of it so I can file a change order. Well, so it, along those lines, we're not necessarily even talking about whether or not it's a security change, right? The ability to Correct. be successful and of course, get to that security mindset is if you can't see it, you don't know if it's good or bad right? That monitoring piece is critical. It's like, it's like saying, uh, you know, who's knocking at the door? Well, if I go look through the people, I can give you an answer. It's UPS, it's FedEx, it's grandma. And as I go through this list, suddenly I'm starting to get into an area where it's like, these are less and less likely that I want to, you know, unlock or open the door, right? Like, oh, it's FedEx, got to get that package. But, you know, maybe it's, uh, you know, distant relative that you really don't want to see ever. Uh, and you made the mistake of leaving the door unlocked and just said, come in. Yeah, for sure. So do you think when you, you said baseline and, I, and it made me think about something and you said it's a, it's a constant baseline or a constant baselining, if you will. Do you think this also gets into, you know, after I do the baseline the first time, I need to continue to raise the bar of the baseline because I think that as you build the services into the stack and as you start to evolve the environment towards a culture that's embracing that security model, you should, I would think the baseline is going to start to change. Is that, is that fair? Yeah. Okay. Microsoft has their magic wand and they go, you know what? We're going to, we're going to enable a feature and not going to tell anybody about it. And then, at some point, you'll find out, oh, there's something called modern authentication. That one caught everybody by surprise. Right. Right. And, uh, you know, what people forget and something as simple as that, older tenants, it's not on. So you sit right. there, somebody like gets Like security breached. defaults. Yeah. Well, that's different. But yes, but just modern authentication, real sure. good example. A mailbox gets compromised. What do they do? You have to go to the resource center and, you know, you know, scout swear that... I have enabled two-factor and I promise never to do it again. Right. And I've checked their rules and I've done all those things, right? And what's one thing that's missing from there? And you just have to know that before you turn on two-factor, you have to turn on modern authentication. Right. Right. It's, it's something that minor where you turn it on, the customer has 15 people. You have 15 people who can't log in because the modern authentication checkbox is the thing that pops up the two-factor. Right. Right. So... Have you, when was the last time you went through all your tenants right. and looked for just simply that one little setting? I guarantee you, it's probably never. Well, right? I, had, I had one the other day that was kind of, I don't want to say it was trivial, but with, with two-factor authentication, you have like the secondary recovery. It says put in like an email address yes. or put your email address. Funny enough, if your email address before the at sign is short enough, then when you click to do the recovery, it actually shows the whole email address. I was like, well, wait a second. This could be a real big problem. And it's not something that's like listed. And it was a change because prior to that, uh, it was like one character, maybe two that showed up and the rest were asterisks. Now it's like, I think it shows five characters. Well, I'll tell you right now, uh, my, my email address would have been, hey, look, that's who that is. Got it. Yeah. And, and once you come up with those, those policies, whatever they may be, I mean, you got to stick to them. Right. Um, I just, it will, I know we're tangenting on 365, but I just, it's, it's a These really are good, good examples. These are good. It's examples. a good example. So like if, if you have a policy in your office, okay. Uh, for example, in your MSP, um, when somebody leaves, what do you do? 
the customer nine times out of 10 is going to say, Hey, so-and-so left forward the email and help desk person's going to get that and go forward the email, check, got it, forwarded the email. And then uh, unbeknownst to everybody else, we turn on two factor. Well, what happens there? Well, now you breaks. have all these, well, you have all these unsecured accounts right? because somebody left and, and because they asked for the email and you did, well, the hacker dark web scans gets their password, right? Username password. It goes, Hey, you need to set up two factor. Why? Yes, I shall. And now the bad guy is setting up two factor because right. the employee who left three years ago was never around to turn right. it on. Right. So it, it comes back to that, going back to that, that baseline and the continual metering of it. How many stale accounts do we actually have? I mean, we, you just said yeah. housekeeping really without saying housekeeping, right? Your TikTok video example is like, this is a hundred percent like, Hey, it's, it's Tuesday. We're, we're cleaning all the bathrooms and, and showers. Like this is not something that you can just set on a shelf and say, Hey, because we did a baseline, we're good. Like, and I think yeah, clients, it's not a forever. Right. Yeah. And, and I think clients really struggle with that. Like I had, and you, you probably remember a specific client that you and I worked together with like, Hey, we're going to do your annual security assessment gee, I wonder what's happened in 12 months in your environment yeah. repeatedly every month or every week or every day that we're getting a little glimpse of it once a year. Like you don't keep your house in that kind of order, I hope, right? Like you don't go, well, today, this is day before Thanksgiving, time to clean the bathrooms and showers. Can't wait. <laughs> yeah, Looking it's just to it. so many people. It's, it's so scary. They just don't take it serious. Um, they don't know how to, they don't know that that's something that they need to take serious. I truly believe that the majority of our clients have a belief system in place, whether it's a cult, religion, however you want to describe it, that's tied to trusting the idea that the vendors have their best interests and protection in mind. And in some cases, maybe they do, but the reality is Microsoft can't be visually everywhere. Microsoft staff is not looking at every single mailbox every day. They don't have enough resources for that. I got to stop you there because I got an email today stating I had stuck mail in quarantine and I went and logged in and released it. It, it never came to me. Sorry. I just That... that <laughs> That means that you took care of it, Mr. Microsoft. That was weird. It, it came to Google. I don't know why Microsoft's using Google, but whatever. You know, but it's, it's, little, it's little things like that, right? They're helping each other out. Yeah, I just, I, I'll give you one more quick story. And this kind of will drive the point home. Uh, we, we took on a customer and what do you do? You start running your baselines, right? And this customer has 60 employees. So I call an emergency meeting with the HR director. I said, I just need to understand something. If we have 60 employees, why on earth do we have 214 email accounts? Like, no, we don't. Th those are all old employees. Like, n no, n no, they're not. <laughs> they're, they're active. And look, some of these are actually being logged into still. Right? Yay. Yeah, it goes back to that, that uh, when the customer calls and says, hey, can you forward that email? I, I try very hard to instill um, uh, like standing on a table and still talking to the team. Like when, when somebody calls and they say they want to forward the email, what you need to know is you need to make it a shared mailbox. Just, right. just for an example, you have to be better than them. They don't know. Actually, you just, you just hit the nail on the head. Remember, they're also relying on you to be better than them. Right. Correct. They didn't They're hire always, you to be the same. Yeah. You know, the big, the big thing on the desk is a hard drive. Right. And then when you go, no, that's actually a computer. It's not a hard drive. The hard drives, you know, little tiny thing inside. You'll correct them on that, but you won't correct them when they go, can you forward an email? Becky left. <laughs> go, go back to your advice. Well, what happens nowadays? You turn on password self-service. IT changes the password. Rogue employee goes, forgot password can't log right. in send it to my gmail they're back in and nobody's Which, the wiser right so uh in in lieu of, of just staying in the 365 camp <laughs> and calling this 365 the the, the noise minutia to be a successful msp well i say let's we'll shift gears a little bit and let's talk about the security awareness training do's and don'ts if you're not doing security awareness training with your employees and in engaging your clients on some security awareness training it is paramount 
And, and one of the things that I think is really important that, that I, I take away from a podcast I listened to again last week was cybersecurity today where uh, it was the October 29th week in review wrap up. And the conversation was with uh, Dina Davis of Arctic Wolf. And she was talking about similarly to the other podcast I referenced this getting started mindset. So now in the same vein, we're talking about the getting started because I was inspired. Um, But in the, in the conversation, one of the things that really hit home for me was uh, we have a memory span of about three to four weeks before the information that we're ingesting starts to kind of fall off and no longer become uh, front of mind. It kind of goes back to what you said about housekeeping. You know, you got to do it on a regular basis. And I think security and awareness training really kind of piggybacks on that, right? Because if we were doing security training components in the vein of, hey, how to do good AD hygiene to my own employees, and I'm making them listen to that every month, like, hey, I am not going to do email forwarding. I'm going to do secure or mailbox sharing. That's 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 part of that security awareness training, right? Like, this isn't just a like in the corner like random stuff. This is stuff that actually helps our employees be successful when they're dealing with our clients, but. What I wanted to talk about is the do's and don'ts. Charles, I know you're doing some security awareness trainings, and I know you've done a lot of the anti-phishing stuff to help. What's what's the one thing that you would say don't do? So don't call out the employee. <laughs> why, why not? Right. Why not, Charles? Well, two things. One, did so you, you can't necessarily prove the employee clicked it, first off. Definitively, um, no. No. Uh, cause sometimes spam filters like to click links, right. right. J- just to test. So there, there is always context. Um, but you, they know, they know, sure. right. So if an employee clicks the link that I sent them, cause it was a phishing attempt, they, in a nice way, it goes, Hey, just so you know, you, you did a dumb thing. You probably shouldn't do that. And right. now they're in fear, right. Waiting for the boss to come knock it on the door. Hey, you know, so-and-so, you know. Did you click that Amazon link? You know, that kind of stuff. And but it was know. for a $10, it was a $10 gift exactly. card. What do you mean? I, of course I clicked on it. But the, the key, the, the reason I do it to the employees, and sometimes I'll do it monthly. Sometimes I'll wait and do it quarterly. I definitely keep them on their toes. Right. I can I can pretty much assure you, there's not a link that comes into the office where people click. Even stuff I want them to click. I have to literally go, all right, Bamboo just sent you a survey. It's not a fish. I need you to do it, <laughs> right? They, just, they, in the office, they're, they're so used to it. But what's good is it's training them, unbeknownst to them, to look for what's a bad link, right? Right. And now they can experience it so that when the customer goes, hey, can you check this for me? They can go, oh, my God, look at this, look at this, look at this. Here's all the reasons why this is bad. Well, you now know, you're, and now you're building confidence, right? Now you're, you're, you're helping sure. them be successful because the reality is if they only fail, are we teaching them? Yeah. And there's a, you know, there's a, uh, there's a couple of companies out there in the media who have said, if you fail the fish test twice, you're out of here. Right. Right. And, and, and I don't, I don't want my team living in fear. And I failed it six times, but they don't know. Yeah. So I'm still here. Well, I mean, if you keep failing it, I may remove some of your access. Absolutely. You know I mean? Well, and I like, think that goes back to, you know, that first, the whole first part of the, the episode we were talking about is, you know, what to do first. And you, you really hit home this whole, you know, hyg- good hygiene, house cleaning, the secure baseline. And, and I think that those lend themselves to a security awareness training that is successful because the activities that you're requiring your staff to go through, they work a lot better when they're also being reinforced with why. Right. Like yeah. you were willing to share the the Becky email, uh, even though you knew that wasn't the best practice, but you'll 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 rip them a new one because they got the definition of SQL backwards. Right. Like you you will lay into them for the wrong reasons. <laughs> what do you why are you calling me? This isn't a printer problem. This is obviously a user issue. You should be calling. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like like the problems yeah. that we inflict on ourselves are like. I can't get the software to run. Oh, well, where'd you get it? Well, I downloaded it off the internet. It keeps asking for admin privileges. Please give me your admin privileges. Your guys, I almost guarantee would say no. 
Yeah. Yeah. And uh, there's just so much to it. And, you know, uh, customers will, will get uh, lulled into a false sense of security very easy because sure. they, they will go, we're going to have cybersecurity uh, insurance. And then they'll fill out the form without even asking me. Right. Right. Do we do security training? Yes. Do we do this? Yes. And I go, how, how are you doing it? Well, it's in the handbook. Yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah, it, it, the handbook says, don't be stupid. That, that's essentially what it says. So I got, right? I got one more that I want to add to this before we shift into the, to the last point. So again, I'm, I'm quoting uh, Arctic Wolf here. They were talking about continuous training. Like this is an ongoing all the time, never yes. stops happening. And so I, I kind of was thinking about that as I was driving back from Chicago and it was really resonating with me because a lot of security programs that get stood up are like, we did our annual training, right? Like there's even frameworks. Like if you get into like HIPAA compliance, a lot of the stuff that's part of the security rule says that you will do this on an annual basis, right? You will check these things annually. Um, I'm sorry, security is not a once a year thing. Uh, training can't be a once a year thing. So I know that you are doing security awareness training. How do you approach that? So it's not this overwhelming burden on your employees or your clients to say, oh man, I got another 30 minute, 15 minute, five hour. How do you, how do you gauge that? And how do you make sure that it's consistent so that they trust that the content comes with a level of consistency that they look forward to it more than they dread it? Yep. So I have three different platforms I use. One I'm phasing out. So I really have two. And it really is depending upon the customer. We do a lot of nonprofits. So we have one that's specific for a nonprofit. Sure. But uh, uh, the, the big one we use the most is a 12-month cycle. And what it does, and if, if it's more than five minutes, it's don't. Just don't, right? These, these trainings need to be very small bite size so that they can get it done and it's not a big deal. Um, but every month they'll get a course, right? And this month I think is something about uh, password managers. Um, so they'll take those classes and the amount of people who call me up after be like, I had no idea about X, Y, Z. It's kind of funny too. I, I never thought about this until I started doing it. Uh, and I'll use the example of LastPass with a client when I implemented some security awareness training. It started with getting onboarded as their VC. So, and they shared with me their last pa uh, LastPass password through LastPass. And I hadn't used LastPass a lot at that point. And so I got it and I thought it was ironic that they're using this enterprise password manager and they just shared with me basically a password in plain text. Like between LastPass, it wasn't. But then as soon as I went and applied the password into the field, I'm like, wait a second, it's in plain text. I wonder if they actually know that. So I went back and had this conversation with them. They were, they were shocked. They're like, what yeah. do you mean you have the password? And I'm like, no, look. And I, and I showed it to them. They're like, well, well, this is, we're going to have to get rid of this. I'm like, hold on time out. This is a lack of understanding of password management versus password sharing or credential sharing. And when we started to have the conversation, they got really kind of into it. And so I, I gave them this series of, and LastPass has it on their website, a series of LastPass training videos, average user, the admin user. And literally within two weeks, they came back to me and said, we had no idea. We need some help rolling out the more advanced functionality to do single sign-on. Like they led that conversation based on having gotten the training that they needed to understand one of the products that they use in their environment. So they'd been using for probably two years or more. Yeah. Yeah. Man, it's just, the, our world needs to be more focused on that and not forward the email to me to have me read it. I, right. I get so many tickets a month going, Hey, is this junk? I don't know. Do, do you ever do business with these people? <laughs> yeah. No. Then yes. Right? Well, I that, call it, that, that's like calling the ticket or calling out someone for sending you an email that says, um, do you think I should open a ticket for this? Just if I need to open a ticket, I will, but this is my question. You're like, yeah, awesome. Yeah. I just wasted my time and your time. And yes, I still need a ticket. Yeah. So, so Charles, as we look to uh, wrap it up and I want to jump into my last and final point, is it possible to launch a cybersecurity program in one week? Depends. You can launch it. You may not have anybody bought into it yet, 
but you can definitely launch it. So I have this keeps rolling around in my head because there's a lot of room in there. If you aren't doing anything right now, then in one week, you should be able to do an awful lot. For sure. I mean, there's, there's so many helpful tools out there and vendors where it's all buttoned up, like, like everything, dark web, phishing, you name it, right. it's in there, policies, HIPAA, socks, whatever. Um, it's just, you just need to start pushing it. And a lot of these vendors on, are now doing ramp ups, right? Yeah. So you, you just need the one customer and then it one turns into two, two turns into three. And then you just kind of, you want exactly. one that'll ramp up that doesn't have a crazy, you know, uh, to, to buy this software before you see it, you have to sign a five-year deal. It's right. It's an incremental process. In fact, I would argue that if you're buying software and you're paying or committing to a three and five-year contract, has a terrible idea when it comes to the tools and software we use in security. They are changing way too fast to get yep. locked into something that's going to be potentially obsolete in 12 months. For sure. I'm not thrilled about a one-year deal, but I totally get you know, why we do that. Yeah, but that's fair. It, we, we, we ask our clients to sign at least a one year. Yeah. So, well, the, the fairness, bigger, yeah, true. But, <laughs> but the bigger thing here is you, you have to have something adopted internal so that everybody has it and they see it and they could talk to it. And then when the customers are having issues, then account management can go to those people. Like, hey, let me show you something. I just took a test yesterday on last pass two factor. Right. Let me show you this. And oh man, we totally need that. Cool. You know, it's the, it's going to be too much for you at $3 a month. I apologize. <laughs> right. It's a culture change though. It's a culture yeah. change. And I don't mean culture change with your clients. Your clients are expecting these kind of things. It's a culture change internally because now you're saying not only are you uh, a tech, you're also a consultant. You're also a salesperson. You're also all of these things, not because you're in the business of selling on my behalf or the, the behalf of the company, but you're in the business of helping your clients become protected. For sure. And how else are they going to get it? And I don't think you want to be in the space where it's like, well, if you go to Best Buy, you can get a good copy of Kaspersky shrink wrap, bring it home. You'll be golden with your AV, right? How do I install it? Right? Like there's, there's so many things that come into play suddenly because you put too much responsibility on them and you wouldn't be in the equation if, if that's what they wanted. Right? So uh, it leads me to a couple more things that I want to, I want to touch on real quick. One is and we've kind of been talking about it throughout without using these words. It is all about managing your risk, right? If we manage risk well, then the tools, services, et cetera, will align with the risk rather than buying security tools and services and just letting risk be mitigated. But just for sure. Financially, that's going to be a derailing process for a lot of smaller organizations are like, ah, we got the $10,000 firewall and it's dialed in. We got people watching it. It's only costing us $40,000 a month, which is far exceeding our revenue stream. But you know what? We were not going to get hacked. Yeah. And then they got hacked, right? Like um, the other thing that I think is really important along the lines of the training part is to work on communication with your employees and your clients and be transparent. You know, we saw a lot of what happened during like the Kaseya breach and some of these others. I think it's easy to close the doors, turn out the lights and go cry into a pillow. Um, but our clients and our employees expect more from us than that. And we have to be ready for the inevitable, which is sometime the bad thing is going to happen. And how we handle that, how we respond to that is going to determine whether or not we walk away, <laughs> say, less scathed with clients still wanting to pay us for our services. For sure. So I have one last thing that I wanted to bring up. Charles, we just talked in week one, like, hey, you can launch a security program. It can be pretty basic. This is an incremental process. We obviously are encouraging very much that you do security baselines, uh, tackle low-hanging fruit, and do it with an initiative. And then the second part of that is, security awareness training is a no brainer. Like, and there's plenty out there. And if you're an MSP listening and you're an MSP ignite member, I've got some resources for you that would help launch right away, but there's a lot of stuff out there. CISA has stuff that's free to consume. Uh, like th this isn't a, you need to go spend money to start doing a security awareness training. I mean, shoot. If you go to YouTube, 
there's plenty from, you know, just even look at the vendors that you're using. How many of them have security and awareness training uh, modules to consume that would help you at least right there internally? Um, and then the last one is, Charles, I wanted to ask you, what should we talk about as we go into next week to continue this conversation, to continue building on what is what I'll call block one of this build your program? The biggest thing is going to be overcoming objections. You know, my, that, that'll be a, a huge topic, right? So when, when, when the customer says, my guys don't click links, you know, really? Are we, are we sure about that? You know, so do you fish test them? No, no. I just, I tell them not to do that stuff and they don't. And, and I shame them too, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. But uh, helping people overcome the objections will be huge. Um, I mean, like you said, you, you, can, you can start with product day, test it out. And it's okay to change products midstream, right? As long as, you know, it's within your price budget. But well, vendors are keep- changing what their products do midstream. For sure. And, and even for fish testing, uh, the old vendor I used to have, people started to get smart. Right. They realized, oh, they only send it from four different domains, right? So that's why I hold two different suites. Uh, half the year I may use vendor A for fish testing and half the year I may do vendor B. I may mix it up. It really kind of depends. This way it's not so predictive, the one thing that you don't want to do is be so creative in what you're doing that you're guaranteeing that they fail. Because what does that really prove? For sure. I mean, the reality is that there's a lot of work involved to train our staff, to train our clients, to make better decisions when it comes to, we'll just say links. But the reality is, is it can be so much bigger than that. I had I got a phone call from my father-in-law while I was driving back from Chicago, which is a great time to be you know, calling. Um, and he said, and I can hear in the background, uh, please call the following number to fix your computer. And I'm like, just hit the power button. He's like, well, do you, I just, can I just close the, I said, hold the power button down right now and shut the computer off, like kill the instance of whatever is active in that browser. He loads the computer back up and he's like, well, is it okay to go back in there? I'm like, no, no, it's not okay to go back in there. Like pick a different browser right now. Like that, that's what you're going to do right now today. I don't care if it's Safari or what you use, but until we can go in and clean your, your browser cache out, you need to stop. And he really was struggling with understanding why that was such a big deal. And I'm like, I'm pretty sure this is a, a benign malware, right? This is a social engineering that is literally cached in your browser. Or you'd have already been like, hey, my computer doesn't work. It's encrypted. It would not have booted back up. So anyways, it's like, as I went through that process with him and he started to understand what I was getting at, he became more aware and it, I finally walked him through. I was like, so what, what were you doing? He's like, well, I was going and looking at the manual for my pickup truck. I want to set up the Bluetooth, you know, car play, whatever. I'm like, bottom line, you got the little USB cable that plugs into your phone. He goes, yeah, I go click that and you're in car play. That's it. But he really wanted to go further into the, the manual. And I'm like, okay, he found the manual online. He went to that site multiple times. He's like, there's like five links to choose from when he hit Google. And he's like, I must have clicked on a different link. Like you can't think you clicked on a different link. You have to know what you're clicking on before you click on it. And a lot of times those links are very misleading and it could have been a legitimate site that just got, you know, something's been injected into that webpage, you know, bad advertisement or malware. I tell you, those are the worst. Those, those PDF manual sites. Yeah. There are so many nowadays where it's just a cover. It's a fake PDF, but it's the one that you're looking for. Yep. And it's and the first three or four pages might even be legit, the PDF. And then all of a sudden it says, click here to download. And it's like, that's not what I was downloading. Yeah, for sure. All right, Charles. Well, it has been uh, a great uh, opportunity to discuss what cybersecurity uh, components need to be sort of included in your program, where to get started. For those of you listening, this is MSP 1337. Have a great week.